My name is Hannah Polakowski, and I am the Program Manager for our Scientific Consulting Services at Cytobank. The agenda for today's event is I will provide brief introduction to our webinar topic today, which will be followed by a presentation presented by Drs. Shram Kordasti and Richard Ellis from their blood publication last year, as well as some additional follow-on work. And then this will be followed by a live Q&A session where you'll have the opportunity to get your questions answered live by Drs. Sharam Kordasti and Richard Ellis. Um, please, on that note, no, we, are, we will be monitoring the Q&A channel in the webinar. So as the event is going, uh, type your questions into that channel there. So this year is a graphic depicting the topic of today's event, how to translate bench research to the clinic. Uh, so this year is the research cycle, and the three different phases of this research cycle, the clinic, bench, and bite. And the idea is that each step in this process is integral to obtaining high-quality results and data that are assured of biology and not artifacts. So starting at the top here in the clinic, this is the study design phase of the research cycle where you'll start by determining your research question, when you'd like to sample your patients, which tissues you'd like to collect, what control samples are necessary before enrolling any patients and obtaining consent. This is then followed by what we're referring to as the bench phase of the research cycle. This is the experiment design and implementation phase. This is where you'll determine what tools are um, going to help answer your research question, test your reagents, uh, panel design and protocols, and then collect your data. And today, Richard Ellis is going to talk about this portion um, for their study. The next phase in the cycle, which I'll talk about um, how Cytobank can help the, this role or this phase, is the bytes, uh, what we're referring to as bytes or the data analysis portion of the research cycle. And the idea is that you will use uh, computational tools or various machine learning algorithms here to help you identify cell populations, quantify signature features, and look for biomarkers um, in order to obtain reproducible results that you can then translate to the clinic and um, inform decision making there. And so that's why this is all very cyclical. The idea is that you can take these, uh, your data and start over again, move to the clinic, and potentially move through this cycle as necessary. So getting into um, Cytobank's role in this research cycle, um, firstly, Cytobank is a, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is a cloud-based software platform that includes the suite of high-dimensional analysis tools that can help you um, interrogate your data, as well as structured content management components. And this is also, this is going to be really helpful in this research cycle. It's going to allow and streamline collaboration, especially if you have collaborators that are across the globe and uh, various centers. We also have an informatics consulting services comprised of uh, various experts that can help you with this entire research cycle. So we can help, um, you know, whatever phase you're at, uh, your study design, experiment design. So when you get to the bytes portion, the data analysis, where we have these tools to help you, um, you, you're assured that you have high quality data and you know that you're looking at results um, that are indicative of biology. So the idea in this bite is that these machine learning algorithms are going to help you uncover data insights um, and aid in data interpretation. And so here is a figure from um, Sharam and Richard's paper, and they'll talk more about later today. And the idea is that they used Disney as this machine learning algorithm, and it helped reveal um, a, a clinically relevant uh, discovery, which they'll talk about what that was. Cytobank also contains other features that can help power your analysis in this bite portion of your research cycle. Um, the raw data processing tools, 
uh, various analysis tools for clustering, dimensionality reduction, or data visualization, as well as characterization and customization tools. And um, you'll see some of these throughout Richard and Sharam's presentation. And two of note, uh, they'll talk about SPADE and BISNI a little bit and how they use those tools. This is an example, machine learning pipeline. So again, the idea is that you want to ultimately take your, uh, you want to analyze your data in a way that uh, you can take these results to the clinic. And, and one way to do this is to build a data analysis pipeline for um, more efficiency and to generate reproducible results. And so this here is a data analysis pipeline using various tools found inside a bank um, to get to your goal. And so here, you know, the goal was to find statistically significant uh, biomarkers. And so today, Sharam and Richard will talk about their data analysis pipeline and what they did for their study. So in addition to building a data analysis pipeline and using these machine learning tools to uncover insights, uh, another challenge and to consider in this portion of the research cycle is your data volume and structure. And so this here is the study design that uh, Richard and Sean will discuss later today. But as you can see from this study is that they ended up with um, a pretty sizable study. They had, uh, they were looking at aplastic anemia patients that are undergoing immunosuppressive therapy. They collected PBMC samples from these individuals at diagnosis and then evaluated their response afterwards and had uh, three different groups um, with varying numbers of individuals in each group. And as part of their study, which we'll get into the details, is they wanted to look at a very small subset within each of these groups. They wanted to look at the Treg compartment. And to do this, they needed to sample enough cells from each of these files in each of these individuals to be able to detect this population of interest and compare across the group. And so the advantage for them of using Cytobank uh, TSNE is that it allowed them to look at 2 million events simultaneously in a given Disney run and that these analyses completed two to three times faster than any local desktop solution. So we're able to crunch through this data a lot faster than using um, alternative uh, methods or tools. Another advantage of uh, cloud compute, especially as um, you have a large volume of data, is that it's going to allow you to fine tune your parameters. So in the same way that you have at the bench, you need to test your reagents and your panels and, the, and your protocols, it's the same thing when you get to the bytes portion, is you need to test your tools and, and kind of fine tune these to get the appropriate uh, visualization or cell clustering, whatever that tool is being used for. And so here, um, the advantage in Cytobank is that you have access to cloud compute and it's going to allow you to fine tune these parameters. And so here are four different Disney runs where the perplexity is one parameter that is being adjusted. So you could simultaneously set up all of these runs and then evaluate what is the appropriate setting for your particular data structure. So in the end, all of these components together, the clinic, the bench, the bytes, uh, is going to allow you to uh, discover new clinical insights using this cycle. And so here is a depiction from um, Richard and Sharam's work on, on how they were ultimately able to follow this process. They're starting the clinic. They're going to talk about what was the research questions that they were trying to answer, how they moved to the bench to address these questions, and then how they use these different data analysis tools to, uh, to analyze these data, and then ultimately to take these findings back to the clinic. So before introducing our guest speakers, um, I just want to make note that here are some few resources uh, that you can take a look at after this event. Um, and then also just a quick note that um, as, as you're watching this and you're like, oh, hey, this would be great. I could use some help with data analysis. Um, please feel free to contact us at this email address here, services at cytobank.org. We're happy to talk to you and schedule a consultation for our consulting services. And without further ado, it is now my great pleasure to introduce our guest speakers today. 
Dr. Shram Kordasti, physician scientist and appointed senior lecturer at King's College and King's College Hospital in London, and Dr. Richard Ellis, flow cytometry manager at the National Institute for Health Research Biomedical Research Center at Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust and King's College London. Uh, Dr. Kordasti established the role of regulatory T cells in myelodysplastic syndrome and their effects on disease progression and response to treatment during his graduate training. Today, his laboratory investigates the plasticity of CD4 positive T cells and their role in the immunobiology of bone marrow failure syndromes using computational biology tools and multidimensional cytometry, which you'll talk about momentarily. Dr. Richard Ellis is a flow cytometry expert with a research background in immunology and diabetes. You will find this cytonaut today working as the CYTOF specialist in the Biomedical Research Center Immune Monitoring Facility at Guy's Hospital. He has been coaxing mass cytometry data from each version of the instrument since it was introduced to the UK in 2012 and is pleased to welcome the recent addition of the Fluidine Hyperion to the flow core. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sharon Kordesti. Uh, uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, uh, what we did about regulatory T cells uh, uh, study by Cytoff uh, with Richard, uh, who's here. Hey. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, the experiment we designed to identify subpopulation of Tregs and how uh, these Tregs correlate with uh, response to immunosuppressive therapy. But before I uh, talk about that, I'm just going to introduce the disease itself because we are talking about a relatively uh, uh, rare disease. Um, if you uh, look at my screen and uh, look at this uh, uh, cartoon here. It shows a group of diseases in the bone marrow uh, that uh, you have uh, at one end uh, the diseases like aplastic anemia uh, coming to myelodysplastic syndrome and acute myeloid leukemia. Of course, not always aplastic anemia becomes MDS or AML, but this is a group of diseases that we call them bone marrow failure and means that bone marrow is not able to produce uh, mature and functional uh, blood elements. So if you look at a healthy bone marrow, as you can see, about 50% of uh, bone marrow, healthy bone marrow, are, depends on the, uh, on the age, of course. You have uh, different cells which are in the different levels of differentiation. Uh, whereas in very autoimmune uh, type of disease called aplastic anemia, you have almost empty bone marrow and hardly any cell are uh, present in the bone marrow. And when it comes to myelodysplastic syndromes, you have a different problem. The problem is actually you have more cells compared to healthy donor or aplastic anemia, but these cells cannot differentiate. And uh, these patients are prone to uh, malignant transformation, uh, which uh, is acute myeloid leukemia. These are, uh, aplastic anemia is a relatively rare disease, but sometimes difficult to uh, treat. Although majority of them respond to a combination of immunosuppressive therapies, but about 30% of these patients, they don't respond to therapy. And uh, they may act actually in longer term progress to MDS and AML. Uh, so it is important to identify this group of patients and identify uh, other types of therapy like bone marrow transplant. Uh, so to summarize the immunological finding in these patients, I use this cartoon to show in one end in aplastic anemia, like many other autoimmune diseases, you have uh, a reduced number of regulatory T cells, uh, expansion of T helpers, CD8 activated NK cells, which leads to a cell death stem progenitor cell uh, going through apoptosis, and you will have a vicious circle of cell death, immunogenic cell death, and expansion of autoreactive T cells. As the disease progresses, uh, 
uh, the, due to this uh, chronic inflammation, uh, in particular in MDS patients, you have expansion of myeloid drive suppressor cells, uh, which lead to expansion of regulatory T cells and uh, lack of proper uh, immune elimination of malignant clone. So uh, this is important to uh, identify patients at this, what stage of the disease they are. For instance, in aplastic anemia, we can hopefully uh, in near future using things like expanded T-Rex, which are in vitro expanded, or low dose oil to, to control the inflammation and expand T-Rex, whereas when it comes to uh, MDS and higher risk disease, uh, we need to use a different uh, strategy targeting myeloid drug suppressor cells or Tregs or blocking uh, S100A9, which is important for this expansion of MDSCs, or use checkpoint blockers, etc. And of course, myeloid drug inflammation uh, needs to be inhibited. But uh, the, the, the focus of today's talk is about aplastic anemia. And we wanted to see whether a plus, uh, we can use a T-Rex signature to predict response uh, to therapy at time of diagnosis and therefore use it as a guide uh, for deciding what is the best way of treating these patients. But the problem we have is T-Rex definition is mainly based on manual gating or what we call it expert gating. And the problem is, what if the experts are wrong? Uh, obviously, when you use this manual gating to define T-Rex, it's hard to reproduce. It's uh, subjective and biased, usually, and very inefficient when you do large marker panels and time consuming if you want to look at large experiments. And I think one of the important problems is when you have a result from one center, uh, it's very difficult to comparing these results with other centers or other colleagues or collaborators when they work on same subject or same uh, disease. To give you an example, I actually asked three experts that are working on, on T-Rex for several years to gate a T-Rex population uh, from uh, two patients and one healthy donor. One patient uh, who responded to immunosuppression, this is at time of diagnosis, a patient without, um, with no response and a patient and a healthy donor. Then I asked these three experts to uh, gate CD3, CD4 positive cells. There was really no problem and more or less they could identify these cells at the same uh, level. But when it came to CD25 high, uh, as you can see here, uh, there is a uh, very significant difference between uh, expert A, B, C in identifying CD425 high. And uh, I have to say, you can't uh, say which one is right or wrong. There is no right and wrong. And each of them, they have a reason to define these uh, cells at 25 high or um, uh, say these are high because of this reason or that reason. But this is a difference between uh, these experts and we cannot really argue with that. And even if you go to uh, more specific markers like 127 low or FOXP3 positive, it, I think it's much more clear that uh, these gatings don't agree with each other and they are uh, quite different. And other than that, uh, as you can see here, for instance, in these patients uh, with uh, which didn't respond to immunosuppression therapy, uh, if you look like the enrichment or interquartal range of expression of one to seven is quite different from healthy donor or the other patient who responded, and the range of Tregs uh, you can see is quite different between these three uh, experts gating, and of course, if you go to uh, what we call Sakaguchi subpopulation of T-Rex. Uh, really, if you uh, move this T-Rex 2 gate uh, slightly to the left or to right, 
you have a completely different uh, picture of T-Reg subpopulation. So really it's not a good way of defining regulatory T cells and we need a more robust uh, definition for these, especially for patients if you want to in longer term rely on this uh, T-Reg subset as a marker for uh, predicting response to therapy. So we decided to go for uh, using uh, CITOF as a uh, way of uh, deep phenotyping for T-Regs and I hand over to Richard to explain how we did the, uh, uh, how we use CITOF for this. Thanks. So it was actually immediately apparent when you first came to us in the core facility with this project um, that this is a great fit for CITOF. This is a project which involves deep phenotyping, so very fine immune phenotyping, and it was working on liquid biopsies. So working with peripheral bloods is a great sample tissue, uh, a good fit for doing site off work. It's one of the easiest things that we could work with. And it was an immune-based project. So there were lots of uh, antibodies either available commercially or that we could make ourselves to run in the study. Now, I should start by saying that CITOF is uh, the trade name um, given to it by uh, Mass Cytometry by uh, Fluidine Corporation. And uh, the picture shown here is actually, I've already been teased for this, but this is an older version of the CITOF that the study was actually done on. And some of the things would actually be easier on a, a current generation instrument. But uh, nevertheless, it still allowed us to do the same basic things, which is to scan uh, isotopes um, by mass cytometry, so we were able to pick out individual masses um, with very high resolution and very little spillover, so great for doing large panels. And this is something that at that time just couldn't be done by flow cytometry. And the way that uh, these are done, you're probably familiar with this, but uh, these are antibodies labelled with uh, metal isotopes, so individual pure metal isotopes for each antibody. So every specificity of antibody can be labelled with, with an individual uh, metal isotope. Now, each of these isotopes will be loaded onto the cells. And when the cells are injected into the instrument, they enter the plasma. And we see the bright light in here where the cells are completely ionized in the instrument. And all of the metals that are on there are then released. And we can count basically the number of ions of each. So we can sum up the amount of each different mass which is present in the machine. Now, what I want to point out here is uh, a basic gating strategy which is used in flow cytometry but can be done just the same in uh, mass cytometry. So in flow cytometry we'd often start with uh, forward scatter and side scatter. Those aren't things that we can do in CITOF. We uh, uh, surrogated that with a, a DNA marker here. But we'd do a viability stain. We'd remove any cells of uh, other lineages. We typically look at CD3 T cells and then we'd split them and we'd look at the CD4 positive cells. And for Tregs, we look at CD25 high and 127 low cells. And then we can go on to look at things like uh, FOXP3 and so on. So some of these markers can clearly be done on the cell surface. And as in uh, conventional flow, that's great if you want to sort the cells and to purify them and carry on working with live cells. But often when you want to investigate more about these cells, you have to do intracellular staining to find out what the functions are. And that's what we're doing in here. So we're building up a much bigger panel to look at uh, what these cells are actually doing. Now I've shown you the typical gating strategy to show you we can do exactly the same thing in CITOF as in um, flow cytometry, but it's important to recognize that we wouldn't just rely on this gating strategy. We'd, we'd miss any of these cells that we're maybe not expecting to see in there. Typical staining patterns allow us to see um, uh, Tregs in a, a very conventional way. So in this first plot here, I've got a, CD25 high cells and 127 low. So it's a classic Treg population. But in order to resolve this really nicely, we actually use two separate clones against CD25. So both of these clones be labeled with the same metal isotope, but that actually gives us a much brighter signal, enabling us to resolve these CD25 bright cells really well. And the next thing we went on to do obviously from that to um, corroborate that is the FOXP3 stain. And you can see here, uh, the effector cells, the conventional T cells, are shown by this uh, red peak and they're FOXP3 negative. And on the whole, these ones within the Treg gate are FOXP3 positive, uh, shown in blue here. So we've got a very good stain for FOXP3, but we actually had to develop that um, specifically for this assay. And what we did was looking at what was available for staining FOXP3. 
So there are multiple um, clones available, and each of these might recognize different epitopes on the FOXP3 molecule. This enables us to use three separate monoclonal antibodies. We test these in all sorts of different combinations. And as in this paper from 2010, there are different combinations which uh, at least allow uh, a greater stain than any of those single stains alone. Um, but using all three gave us uh, the best, most consistent staining and really elevated this marker, which is relatively dim, even in conventional flow, to being quite bright and easy to uh, define in our cells. There are some other con uh, considerations as well. So the antibodies that we do this with must be compatible with the metal labeling chemistry that we use. This is the max power chemistry that Fluidine used to label all their antibodies commercially. And we use that same chemistry for all the ones we make in house as well. Then we look at uh, the staining protocol and we need to ensure that we can uh, see all of the epitopes. So where we're doing something like nuclear staining with this kit, we'd be doing um, uh, a fixation and perm step, and we need to ensure that any antibodies that we're labeling with uh, aren't inhibited by that if they come after the fix and perm step. So in this uh, assay, we do a surface stain first, then an intracellular stain. And then we'd also have to look at things that uh, stimulation changes within the cells. So in these cells, um, in one of the conditions, we would obviously see that the CD4 um, uh, would be decreased. So using a, an intracellular stain for CD4 uh, enables us to still find those cells. So we can see the order of the, the staining we here. We do first a viability stain, then we block any non-specific binding sites for antibodies, and then we do a surface stain uh, against all the surface molecules. We would then fix and perm, and then do an intracellular stain where we do both nuclear and intracellular markers so looking at the cytokines and then we would fix the cells and this is a longer fix um, to enable them to run on the site off and a DNA stain which allows them to be visualized on the site off. So using those tools that we developed we were able to um, design panels but rather than have one panel to um, complete the whole experiment this actually required two separate panels to enable us not to have to compromise on what you pick up in each panel. So there were two panels here. One was um, based on phenotyping and one was based on function, but they had a, a large overlapping common core. And that enables us to do uh, a lot of uh, analysis to see exactly what types of cells were in there. We didn't just throw the panel together. We designed it for intensity and uh, co-expression. So we're looking at how intensely staining each of these markers were and which cells they were expressed on so that we didn't have uh, large overlaps. So you can have some kind of spillover within um, mass cytometry uh, due to metal impurities and uh, oxidation as well. These are minor effects, but th they will add up in a large panel. And so it's always best to consider these. And actually some of our markers, we did move from one channel to another uh, during iterating the design process. We also used a dump channel. And you might think that when you're using CYTOF, you could get away without doing that, but it's a really handy way to lump together a few markers that you're just going to exclude. And also we needed to account for all the cell types which are present in the sample. We're working with PBMCs here, so we needed to account for everything that's in there. We don't have, um, for example, a lymphocyte gate, and so we need to know what every um, cell that's in there is. So we had two conditions. The stimulation um, one was a four-hour stimulation with PMA and ionomycin. And that meant that we were able to look um, for some other markers which we wouldn't expect to see in the non-stimulated cells. So here are the two panels side by side. You can see the core um, overlap. So there's a really high degree of overlap uh, enabling us to do basic phenotyping. But then in the panel on the left, we see this is the panel for unstimulated cells. And there are things here for doing phenotyping, looking at differentiation and activation and homing markers, for example, the chemokine receptors and so on. Then in the stimulated panel, we're able to look at um, uh, more functional things. So we'll look at cytokines. And an important thing to remember, as well as having these stimulated and expression levels changing on these cells, we'll also have to do um, Brefeldin A treatment as well to lock in the cytokines which are being released in there. So you can see that um, we have uh, easily enough um, uh, markers there to cover the, the sort of Treg lineage markers that um, uh, Sharam mentioned earlier. Um, but obviously we can go into far greater depth to find out more about these cell types. 
So what that takes us to, we've got uh, now a, a staining panel and uh, a toolkit to enable us to examine these cells. We've got longitudinal um, frozen control samples that we can uh, run with each run so that we can uh, run these over a, a number of runs over uh, multiple weeks. And we can look at these cells. So we'll acquire data from uh, patients and controls. And then once we've actually cleaned up that data, so we do initial QC steps, we're then able to take that on into dimensionality reduction. We can uh, run some dimensionality reduction and use those t um plots to generate um, spade clusters and then go on uh, to look in greater detail about these um, uh, cell types which emerge from that. And then we can really look into uh, a much wider array of uh, cells than we'd expect to see with uh, conventional flow cytometry. Okay, uh, thanks Richard. So uh, just uh, to explain a bit further, that's uh, um, this is the pipeline we used as published before, and these are the steps uh, to generate data. And of course, rather than a spade, you can use other clustering methods uh, well, like a flow sum or other clustering method. The important thing is to have a combinatorial approach for uh, this data analysis. So just go back to uh, aplastic anemia, which is kind of uh, autoimmune side of bone marrow failure syndromes. Uh, we have shown before a few years ago that the number of Tregs conventional method was significantly reduced and the um, less Tregs you have, the more severe disease you have. And it correlates also with response to therapy. Uh, and if you look at the uh, uh, conventional definition of T-Rex subtypes based on Sakaguchi definition, uh, what we noticed was two subtypes T-Rex 1 and 2 are uh, reduced in aplastic anemia, whereas T-Rex 3 are actually, to our surprise, was uh, increased in aplastic anemia, which was a bit unexpected, and we weren't sure why, and we wanted to investigate a bit further. So we used this panel that's explained by uh, Richard, and we looked at uh, uh, CD4 population. The reason you don't have that many island in this Wiesne plot is because these are CD4 cells. We identified CD25, high FOXB3, 127 low population. But when you look Look at the density plot. I think it's very clear that you have two population of Tregs. We just call them Treg A and B. And uh, while in he healthy donors, the Treg B are the uh, main population. In non-responder, you have a, a kind of majority of them are Treg A. And in responder patients, is 50/50. Uh, Uh, really, population one and two are more or less Treg B, e, whereas population three is uh, a combination of Treg B, e, and a significant number of cells are actually outside of uh, Treg A area, suggesting that uh, population three is not really a clear uh, Treg population; it's a mixture of different cells. Uh, when we looked at the frequency, of course, this frequency was significantly different at time of diagnosis between responder and non-responder. And uh, these Tregs were uh, based on non-redundancy scoring, if you like. Uh, the Treg A and B, they have a specific markers defining uh, these populations. And if you then stimulate CD4s, uh, as it's clear here, you have area of interferon gamma, IL-2, IL-4, IL-17. But interestingly, TNF-alpha was really all over the place, including a population of Tregs. And within that, uh, in non-responder patients uh, and responder, you, in both you can see the TNF-alpha secreting Tregs within Treg A. But after therapy, uh, in responder patient, these are the ones that are disappearing, whereas uh, in non-responder, they remain. And of 
of course, we looked at other subpopulation of uh, CD4s, naive effects, effects of memory, etc. And there wasn't frequency wise, there was no significant difference, but uh, higher expression of CD161 in non responder. Functionally, T reg, uh, at least on the uh, cytokine secretion, I appreciate that it's not a proliferation assay because we had very low number, we couldn't do that. But in suppressing the interferon gamma and TNF alpha, T reg A are not suppressive compared to T reg B. Uh, when we did T cell receptor sequencing, uh, the data suggests that they are coming from different origin. Nevertheless, uh, they, although they are not that functional, but they share the uh, regulatory human regulatory T cell gene signature uh, between the two. So they do have important genes uh, related to regulatory T cells, both T reg A and B. But when we compare TREG B to TREG A, two uh, gene sets uh, became significantly in, uh, different in TREG B versus TREG A. One is G2M checkpoint, and the other one was IL2 STAT5 signaling. So it suggests that they are prone uh, to proliferation and they are primed to go to cell cycle and they are likely to respond to IL2. Uh, uh, and we wanted to test that. So what we did was uh, we, uh, for the low dose IL-2, we compared whether the uh, phosphorylated STAT-5, they indeed uh, phosphorylated STAT-5 as it's clear on figure A. Uh, after a low dose IL-2, they phosphorylate uh, uh, STAT-5, they expand very well. And when they expand, they are very much similar to healthy donor. No difference in full change expansion and they become functional. Then we looked at a T cell recept, uh, sorry, a T reg specific demethylating region. All 15 sites become demethylated, uh, suggesting these T regs are very much uh, stable and they are polyclonal. But are T reg A become T reg B? It's possible. Uh, uh, what we notice is by calculating the distance between expanded T regs versus uh, T reg A and T reg B, T -re uh, expanded T regs were significant, and this is four T regs uh, population expanded you know, on top of each other. Uh, all of these, of course, very different from a uh, different population like B cells, but expanded T regs are uh, significantly different with T reg A, whereas they are not that different with T reg B. So it suggests that after expansion, majority of T regs are more uh, like TREG B rather than TREG A. Nevertheless, this is not the best way of the distance calculation, although on that time when we were working on it was the best available option. But of course, the question always is, is uh, the similarity or dissimilarity of two population, how to identify that? Uh, you may be aware of this uh, very nice work published uh, by uh, Jonathan Irish group um, this year. And basically the question is, okay, if you have positive population like here, the cells which I'm showing here, how do we know these are the same? And who said that these cells which are positive are the same as these? So obviously this gating or this definition of positivity is not enough and we need something a bit more uh, cleaner and more uh, mathematically calculated how these are different. And the whole point of marker enrichment modeling is based on uh, intercortal range of expression and with the same median, depends on your intercortal range, you may have more enrichment. So this population is more enriched compared to this, while they have the same median. And if you use a standard reference, and then you have a sample to compare to that reference, you can basically uh, identify within your test sample uh, the enrichment for uh, different markers and uh, segregate different subpopulation within your sample compared to your standard reference. And therefore, this is an example of 
how they, you can then define different uh, uh, lymphocytes, or different T cells. And if you say something is positive for CD8, how positive or how negative they are for different markers. Uh, and you have something to compare. Uh, so, after that, uh, the other question we had after this was, of course, uh, when uh, we expand these T rex, how stable they are uh, when you put them in inflammatory environment. And uh, as you can see here, T rex A and T rex B, uh, when they expand, and if you put them in polarizing inflammatory uh, culture, uh, really they don't uh, secrete IL-17 as much. Whereas total T-Rex as defined by CD4, 25, high, 1 to 7, low, they uh, really uh, secrete a lot of IL-17, which suggests that by identifying these T-Rex, uh, the, the way we define these, uh, the T-Rex are really T-Rex, they are quite uh, stable, and perhaps you have less contamination with non t rex which in longer term, if you want to expand these and inject to patients, uh, you will have less of these pro-inflammatory uh, cells. So the summary of data was uh, in pre-immunosuppression therapy, we had a uh, two distinct t rex population that the ratio of these two can predict response to therapy. Uh, and after therapy, again, you can see that this composition is changing, uh, which can be used as a monitoring for response to therapy and for longer term for relapse. Uh, to have a better uh, understanding of uh, these T regs and whether in longer, uh, in larger cohort of patients, uh, we can use uh, this signature to predict response to therapy. There is a clinical trial called RACE trial that King's College is the central uh, research uh, lab, and we're receiving samples and we're recruiting about 200 patients, 100 in each arm, and we are going to see whether this uh, immune signature is useful for predicting response to therapy in these patients, and hopefully in future we may use as a diagnostic test. So, three of my uh, and Richard's presentation was that we uh, using a less biased, if you like, approach and multi-dimensional uh, uh, analysis. We identified two umbrella of T regs, which T reg we call them T reg A and B. And within this, of course, is, we are not saying these are the only T regs. There are several subsets, perhaps, that hopefully you can define them by different methods like uh, MEM, and uh, you will have, uh, you can identify these. And then you can follow this as a type of uh, monitoring for patients, or when you want to expand, which one are better to expand and how to follow them and what happened to them uh, when you treat these patients uh, in longer term. I hope uh, it was uh, useful and we are ready to take your questions. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So just a reminder that um, if you have questions, uh, now is the time to go ahead and type those into the Q&A session of our webinar. Uh, thank you for those of you who have already done so. Um, so I have some questions. This first question is for Richard. Um, so Richard, you mentioned using uh, antibodies that targeted three unique epitopes to detect FOSP3. Did you attempt to target one epitope initially? And if so, was the signal from any particular epitope sufficient enough to detect FOSP3 via Cytos? Uh, yes, that's right. Actually, that was the, the first thing that we tried was just trying one antibody, and actually the, the signal wasn't very strong. And in certain combinations, um, uh, two of the antibodies are sufficient to do that as well. But uh, we found that the just the most comprehensive approach using three always gave us uh, the desired results. So two would be sufficient, but, but three is the, the optimum number. So the, the, the two that I, I was using at the bare 
Chairman and uh, P2590 and um, PCH101. Thank you. Um, so let's see. This question says, how does Cytobank remove the TREG gating bias? This is probably for Sharam. How does Cytobank remove the TREG gating bias that Dr. Cordassi highlighted earlier in the talk? So probably uh, interpreting this, um, maybe how did you use Cytobank tools to remove the gating bias talked about? Yes, I think uh, a good question. Uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, I don't think uh, uh, the, the the message was that Cytobank would do that for you. Uh, obviously, Cytobank is a, a combination of tools that you can use to do so. Uh, the main message is uh, rather than uh, uh, judging the gating, the manual gating on the expression of different markers that we use in sequential gating, is to rely on more of the com uh, uh, for instance, TISNI as a representative of uh, dimension redu dimensionally reduced data that you can actually use that to automatically identify your population based on density and which is perhaps still good enough and go to the subsequent clustering based on TISNI to identify clusters of that are within the t uh, uh, population, if you like and then see how heterogeneous that population is and what you have there. So by no means uh, uh, these things are uh, done automatically in Cytobank. You need to use these tools in Cytobank or outside Cytobank, uh, but that perhaps uh, the sequence of uh, dimension reduction, uh, downstream uh, clustering based on TISNI, uh, depends on what clustering method you use, and then uh, using heat map to visualize it uh, later, or calculating MEMA score or the sequence of uh, things that you need to use. And of course, there are other tools uh, that are becoming available to help you with this. One of them uh, we are working and are hoping to early next year have another webinar to introduce that that can be used uh, to better identify your population uh, based on this uh, pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe just an additional comment. It sounds like essentially you have to determine this combinatorial data analysis approach like you discussed, Shram, and there are various tools to do it, and some of these tools are found in Cytobank. So like in the example I gave earlier, that was one uh, data analysis pipeline that you could use using Cytobank tools, and then Shram and Richard talked about a data analysis pipeline that they use. Um, to remove some of these biases in their studies. Um, so this is a good, actually, follow-up question, maybe to that for Sharam. Um, can you comment on how you decided which tools to use in your data analysis pipeline? Uh, okay. Uh, it was a very difficult decision, very good question. Uh, uh, when we started working on that, it was early days on Cytof, and not many tools were available. Uh, correct me, Hannah, if I'm wrong, but I think even Spade wasn't available on Cytof. So uh, we had to use uh, uh, standalone uh, uh, versions, uh, and basically we followed what we know. Obviously, uh, genomic people are far uh, better than us uh, on these. They've done it for longer. Uh, so basically, it was follow their lead and modify the pipeline they're using for gene expression data analysis, for instance, and translate it to uh, cytometry. Uh, but the thing is, now I think it's uh, more or less a lot of people start working on single cell RNA seq. And the good thing is, this pipeline in combinatorial approach can be used now for single cell RNA seq as well that you can find your uh, population. So it's a two-way learning and also feed the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it kind of sounds like the, you know, the, whole, the whole theme for this webinar is you know, starting, you guys started at that initial step, determine your research question, and then you know, as you move from the bench into the data analysis, the byte portion is at the time, what were the tools available to help you answer your, yes. your research question? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So this 
maybe for both Richard and Sharam. Um, so you mentioned longitudinal frozen samples, or Richard mentioned this in his portion. Um, how were these samples used in the study to normalize a crotch batch, or or were uh, they used? Maybe is the other follow up. Yeah. Um, so the thing just dropped out there, but essentially th these were used so that actually we could get these out and compare the signals from They were well defined, so it means they've all been run on the, the machine lots of times. Uh, in fact, even before uh, we started running the patient samples, these control samples have already been run several times. So we can see the reproducibility between the samples, but also then we can see any variability. So for example, if an antibody were to stop working, it can be spotted at that time. So they, they have to be analyzed as you go. Um, but then also you have this data set that uh, you can compare uh, over time as well. And you can see that uh, we use some approaches now like normalization, but even before those existed, we had some samples in there which would tell us what, what was changing uh, within the study. It controls for the pipetting of the reagents, for example, and so on. Uh, to add to that, uh, basically two uh, essential controls are with each batch, it's important to uh, run uh, same sample again and again. So we usually have for each project a reference samples that we run uh, every time with each batch. And the other thing is uh, uh, using the normalization that to normalize your signals. Uh, that uh, is the first step of data analysis. So this is, I think, a good follow-up question to the previous one. Um, what was your collection strategy? Were these samples barcoded, and how were the batches determined? Um, I'm guessing, since it was early days, that these samples weren't barcoded. But I'll let I'll let Richard answer that one. Uh, no, no, they weren't barcoded. But actually, that, that didn't also have to do with just because it was the, the early days. But uh, because of, uh, we had already determined that these cells could potentially be more fragile as well, we didn't want to subject them to any extra processing, for example. So. Part of the not not using a barcode is actually just a strategy within uh, keeping as many cells as possible in the samples as well. So I think the follow up is: Were there any tips on how you determined your collection strategy or how you you batched batched the sample acquisition? Uh, uh, you mean that, for instance, pre and post uh, samples at the same time? Uh, if that's the question, yes, that's how we did it. Yeah, I'm guessing, my guessing from reading this is maybe maybe they're asking, um, oh, you know, because you had, you had some, no, I don't know, I think each group, like 23 uh, and then 31 healthy donors, You did you run those all on the same day or presumably those had to be acquired on different days and how did you decide which samples were acquired on you know day one versus day 20 yeah we didn't we didn't uh, select based on the type of the sample because it may introduce a bias uh, to your data so basically we uh, uh, run patient we run patients and uh, like I see other projects that we are doing uh, we run patients and healthy donors uh, for, uh, at the same time and we select them based on uh, 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 how many can run one day? But what we found very helpful, if you are uh, looking at pre and post therapy samples, or if you culture cells and you want to see, okay, that culture cell happened to uh, pre and post culture in a specific uh, uh, type of culture, that is uh, uh, we try to run pre and post samples together, and it really helps. And this is uh, uh, what I can recommend to do uh, for any of these kind of samples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably probably what they're asking there. Okay, here's one. So we already answered, how do you normalize your data? Okay, here's kind of maybe a follow-up question to the normalization. How do you normalize uh, MFI, or I guess in this case, Medium MMI, medium mass expression, values from samples run on different days. Okay, so that's actually something that uh, we, we spoke earlier about the normalization beads. And th this is a rage from like that so we can uh, run on its own before any samples are run. Uh, we can run it afterwards, see how the machine has changed. 
but also we can spike these reagents in with the sample cells. So they're running interspersed with the cells. And we've acquired uh, those beads during the run of every single sample in there. And we can see changes in uh, the instrument performance through the day, which are quite minimal. But also we can see changes uh, over different days in uh, how intense the metal is in the beads are standard. So there's always the same amount of metal present in these beads. And uh, they're very reproducible. And uh, the software that we use to normalize that, so we can normalize uh, all of the signals that are in each sample against the beads that are in that sample. And that's run, uh, we used um, uh, a MATLAB implementation, which was written by Rachel Fink, who was then at Stanford at the time. And uh, it's uh, a great tool for just being able to normalize across all of our samples. There is also a normalization tool built into the uh, modern um, software from Fluidime, running on the Helios as well. Uh, it's something that can actually be built in and run against all the samples, comparing them with a, a factory control. Okay. So what that does, when you, when you normalize the samples like that, uh, you, you end up with a, a second set of data. And I have to say, that these, the values actually uh, weren't too different as well. So if the machine is running pretty constantly, and all these were acquired in stream in uh, one period of time, actually there, there weren't many differences between them, but the normalization just helped. We're ruling out any changes in the machine rather than any changes in the expression. So you might see different levels of expression if something really was a genuine difference in expression uh, uh, in the uh, control samples. More likely, though, you might sort of see differences uh, that still arise because of the, say, you've got the staining wrong, you've put too much antibody in something. Those, those would still come out even though the samples are normalized as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So we're at time. Um, so I'm going to wrap up the Q&A portion. Um, but before we head out, uh, Richard and Shram, do you guys have any last closing thoughts that you wanted to share? And for those of you who need to leave now, of course, please please do so. And, uh, I, I just um, I would, I would like to thank everyone for uh, listening to us. And uh, just one Small comments is about uh, uh, site of uh, is a great tool for identifying a novel population and identify specific signatures that are important for uh, clinical use or uh, any day-to-day -day lab uh, uh, or research que answering research question. Uh, the quality control normalization data. And make sure the data that you are using for any subsequent uh, analysis is really, really important. And if you don't have a good quality data, don't try to uh, analyze it before. Make sure, making sure everything is properly done, uh, normalized, and uh, those samples which are not in good quality uh, removed from your database, uh, because otherwise uh, it may be misleading and uh, give you inaccurate results. So that's the only thing I could tell because we had uh, experiencing, uh, it, it, uh, we, we learned this uh, hard way <laughs> on early days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can add to that is that uh, thanks to Bank for um, helping us broadcast this as well. <laughs> thank you both. Great. Well, thank you everyone for attending. And uh, everyone, I hope you enjoy the rest of your days.